we started Welcome in to a special bonus episode of Public Power in. Underground. Public Power Things Underground is Public Power's premier infotainment program that covers public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. I'm Paul Dockery, the creative director of Public Power Underground and manager of the power department for Klatskin IPUD. In last week's episode of Public Power Underground titled Administrator's Discretion, period, not the normal exclamation point, a period, really emphasized the closure of Administrator's Discretion. We shared the first part of an interview with John Harrison, Bonneville Power Administration's Chief Executive Officer and Administrator. In this bonus episode, you get the full conversation with Matt Shretnick, John Hairston, and myself. We go deep into people, culture, and electrification. We play a fun game at intermission, and then get insights into fish, markets, and parenting. Wide-ranging conversation. A little bit of succession got in there. Really proud of that. If you listen to last week's episode, the first segment is repeated here. You can listen again, or we put a timestamp in the Substack newsletter with where to pick up with new content. There's also a timestamp in the YouTube comments and the show notes. So if you are picking back up, you already, you're a avid listener of public power underground we appreciate you and as a sign of our appreciation we are putting that time stamp in so you can jump to where the conversation picks up from where you already heard it but before we jump there um i'm going to take a short break for our presenting sponsor so don't jump there yet of course if you already did then this is uh you're never going to hear this and you're never going to know that i did plead with you to stick around for our promo from our presenting sponsor the presenting sponsor of Public Power Underground is the Energy Authority. The Energy Authority is a nonprofit energy portfolio management company. Why do I mean? What do I mean by nonprofit? Well, TEA is owned by public power entities that makes them more than just public power adjacent. They are as underground as it gets. TEA's mission is to help clients maximize the value of their assets and meet their power supply goals. TEA does this by providing expertise in energy trading, advanced analytics, renewable solutions, and a whole lot more. Over 60 public power utilities have partnered with TEA to tackle their energy future. So if you're looking for one of our own, if we're looking, you know, if you are, and we are one of our own public power organization like us to partner with in navigating the uncertain future of our industry, visit TEA Inc. T-E-A-I-N-C dot org to learn more. T-E-A-I-N-C dot org to learn more. With that intro and with the help of our sponsors, I'm going to hand it off to Matthew Shretnick, eWeb's power planning supervisor and staff counsel to get us started. Diving in. John, hello. Welcome to Public Power Underground. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You know, I've heard a lot of great things about the um, the podcast and, and finally got to get on board. I mean, I'm a little disappointed I was down the list, but, you know, I'll take what I can get right now. So appreciate you guys having me. I mean, can you be disappointed? I mean, we got Russ on and Crystal and, and Rachel. I mean, these are these are all stars. Daniel Fisher. I mean, it's not like you're down the list. It's just like, I mean, they're fun people. Well, and we had to work our yeah. way up to yeah. you. We had to earn the right to even ask is the way right. I was looking at it. Yeah, that's the smarter way, Matt. <laughs> we're we're yeah. targeting electric utility enthusiasts like us. Our, I mean, you're an electric utility enthusiast, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I can say I, I claim to be that either an enthusiast or fanatic, you know, depending on how my kids look at it. You know, they got the, the dose of the... Um, you know, the system and how great it is for the region every time we drove up and down the Columbia Gorge. So I don't know, either way you want to call it fanatic or enthusiast, I'm good. I like both. I like both. Yeah. I'm really, uh, I think I'm both. And my kids get similar doses of enthusiasm whenever we drive by a generator. Yep. Uh, either a claim to fame or accusation, depending on the context. Uh, I exactly. get them as well. So, um, yeah. So uh, first of all, I think, uh, or I'd like to, you know, take a moment here because congratulations are in order, John. Uh, January 7th uh, marked your official one-year anniversary as administrator and CEO of Bonneville Power Administration. Congratulations, sir. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, you know, and also just really appreciate the, um, you know, the, the, the nice little gifts I got in the mail here, you know, yes. a little recognition. So, so appreciate it. This is, um, you know, and I will tell you, it's, it's been a blur this this first year it's been a blur but it's been a really um you know great experience working with some really great people here at bonneville 
yeah, great people work with great people. That's what we do in public power every day. It's why we come to work, right? Um, for those for those in the audio, uh, it's the one year's paper anniversary. So we printed out a paper copy of the clearing up front page of the newsletter where your announcement was nicely framed. I, was, I feel I'm really proud of that. It took a lot, John. I think I think you should be proud of that. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the 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 wonder weight uh, and Adramus championship belt for the best friends of the underground because you you let people come back and I I appreciate that so you get the welterweight title congratulations all right no appreciate it I think mine is on the bookshelf behind me uh, <laughs> it's possibly my most favorite possession so um, I do hope you enjoy that. Uh, and the the pun with the belt is just I, I got to tell you, Paul. I know I've said it before, but that is just top. Uh, that's just a a plus right there, man. Yeah, uh, it really. I can't take credit for it. You know, it's it it's it's the community of public power inspires some of these great things. Um, you know, back to the matter at hand, John. So uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, nothing at all happened in 2021 during your first year. Um, wait, uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, I'm being told that actually a lot happened last year um, uh, at BPA and, and with you, uh, you finalized the record of decision to join the Western EIM. Uh, you maintain grid reliability through wildfires and historic heat wave kicked off the post 2028 provider of choice process, uh, adopted a power rate decrease um, and decided to use uh, the triggering of a reserves distribution clause to reduce power rates. Um, along with a bunch of other stuff that, you know, we're just not going to mention right here because we don't have the time. Uh, point is, I, I think it goes without saying you deserve a victory lap at this point. And so, you know, please take some credit for our first power rate decrease in over a decade. Yeah, well, hey, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and like I said, you know, the first year was a blur and all of those things that you just mentioned made it that, right? You know, there's a ton of stuff to really cover. And, you know, the first thing I will say uh, I've always told our folks that, you know, the only thing I could do after the first day by myself is fail. Uh, this is a team effort, and I've got some really great folks who uh, work hard every day, um, great public servants who come and make sure that we're bringing value to the region. So I, I, I can't um, tell you how appreciative I am of our team. Um, I've been able to put some folks in some really great positions that I trust and, and really know that they're going to execute um, on the things that we have in front of us. But but yeah, you know, this first year, it's been really about adapting. Um, you know, I always think about when I was in college pledging uh, my fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi. Um, you know, one of the big brothers would always tell us, improvise, adapt, overcome, and achieve. And, and, and I see it that way. I mean, despite doing all of our work basically virtually, uh, we've been able, you know, since March of 2020, just improvise initially adapt to our environment um, through what we've done in terms of, you know, all of the things you've mentioned, I think overcome some challenges and, and really achieve some great results for the region. Um, you know, I, if I think about just the success we had, it's, it's really twofold. You think about the, the things that we've done before the pandemic, uh, a lot of work on our culture, a lot of work on our continuity, and that, and that paid off, uh, really. Once we got into this, like I said, we made those we took that opportunity to improvise, adapt, uh, overcome, and achieve through our continuity work, but also the culture aspect. Um, our folks have been able to hold together because we did a lot of work in what it meant to work at BPA, uh, how we should engage with each other, collaborate, and, and that has just tremendously paid off with our workforce. So, you know, I, I really like where we're at, how we've been able to deal with these things, but we're going to continue to learn from this experience. One thing that I understand is that, you know, employees need to be engaged, and we're going to continually work at that, making sure that they feel valued. Uh, we want to be a workplace that, you know, uh, new workers, uh, college graduates prefer. So we're going to look at how we can retain and attract skilled, um, you know, employees in a competitive environment. And, you know, Matt, you, you mentioned the, the rates piece, which is particularly gratifying for me, uh, because if you look at the trend, you look at what we've been able to accomplish. Um, in 2020, um, we looked at the, re the um, reserves uh, surcharge, the financial reserve surcharge. Uh, we had conversations with customers and understanding what folks were going through with the pandemic. Uh, we suspended that. Uh, we followed that up with 
a um, rate decrease uh, for our current rates, which, as you said, has been something we hadn't seen in decades. So that's particularly gratifying for me. And then, you know, just recently, the um, application of the Reserves Distribution Clause, uh, which returns about $3.7 million back to customers during 2022. I, I, I think all of those have been really tremendous achievements by our team collectively. And, you know, of course, um, you know, I throw in there the decision to join the EIM as one of the highlights for the year. Um, I thought that was a tremendously important decision. It wasn't easy. We got plenty of feedback from customers, but at the end, I think we made the right decision for not only Bonneville and its customers, but for the region. And so, um, you know, you lock those in, you talk about borrowing authority, um, our ability, um, our success in increasing our borrowing authority by 10 billion this year. That was a collective effort. We worked with public power to get that across the line. Um, in our, you know, NRU, PPC, um, you know, PNGC, all of those, you know, customers and, and customer groups worked with us to get that across the line. So I look, I really enjoy those collaborative efforts, and I think that's going to bring benefits to the region for years to come. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't give us a blank check, right? Um, you know, I hear customers saying, Bonneville, we don't want you to have this blank check. We want to work on cost control, things of that nature, and, and that's that's what we're going to continue to do. Uh, we're going to be very careful about how we make these investments, making sure that we invest in the right assets at the right time, and, you know, through our financial plan refresh, <clears throat> we're, we're really giving voice to our customers and listening to ensure that we have the right policies to maintain prudent debt levels for the long term. Uh, I think a great example of that is what we just announced yesterday in respect to B2H. Um, that proposal yeah. with Idaho Power and Pacific Corps, um, I think, is a really good, clear step in that direction. You know, rather than being part owner, uh, we're proposing to uh, purchase transmission service on the line to serve our Southeast Idaho customers in a more reliable, economical manner. Um, and I really believe that at the end of the day, this construction of this line would um, not only provide significant benefits to the region, but it was going to also enable this long-term firm power and transmission service to our customers um, that we've been seeking. Uh, you know, we've been wanting to do this in a cost-effective manner. And so this, um, you know, and I caveat it with the fact that we just signed a term sheet, so it's not binding, but it's moving in the right direction, and I, and I really feel good about that. Yeah, I, you know, you started the conversation with culture. And then I think as you go through the list of accomplishments, it speaks to the culture that's been developed, right? The the discipline about cost controls, bending the cost curve down, speaks to the power, um, you know, reserves distribution clause going back to power, it speaks to the rate decrease. Um, and one of the areas I was really curious about, because you took over um, during the pandemic, and to maintain that culture, remotely in a lot of instances how how do you do it like what any any tips for like maintaining disciplined culture remotely anything looking back on your first year that you are proud of in culture preservation yeah you know i would specifically speak to what our managers have been able to do uh, because you know when you go through something like this pandemic uh you know you your workforce is dispersed and so you have to have some knitting there to make sure that they come back together, um, they're able to execute on the mission, know how they connect to that mission. And so managers play a key role. And, and we put in place some managerial behaviors that I think have been effective. Um, okay. You know, valuing our people, uh, coming together around decisions, making sure that we connect to the mission, um, sticking to priorities, uh, listening more than talking. Uh, you know, passing on information when, you know, it's important. And then also this con what we call a considerate done kind of ethic where, you know, when we have that conversation and we lay out the outline for what we need to have done, you know, we can consider that done. We know we can count and trust on our teammate to get that done. And, you know, when you employ those behaviors, um, I found that, you know, it, it allows our employees to understand where they're at, you know, in this space, you know, during a pandemic and be yeah. able to then, you know, really contribute in a, a, a real productive manner. Um, 
and they also understand how things are being done. So that really lends itself to its culture, to our culture, and it's and it's maintained pretty. Um, it's been maintained pretty strong, I think, throughout the pandemic. I really like that considerate done talking point because it does take trust, especially in remote working. You have to have trust in your your coworkers, colleagues that it's done. You got to. I, I like that framework. It's good. I wanted to follow up on B2H um, a little bit because it, it is news. So we're taping this on January 20th. That news came out January 19th. Um, and one of the things in the letter to the region uh, that w- was the reason for reconsidering was that the, there were complexities involved with ownership of land and assets by federal and non-federal parties. How, how much, it seems like it was multifaceted, but can you speak to that a little bit? It was in the letter and I, I kind of stood out to me as, uh, maybe an interesting thing to dig a little deeper. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think pretty simple, um, simply put, is that when you're dealing with the federal government, um, you know, there's a lot of things along the lines of permitting, and, you know, you have folks who are not wanting things in their backyard. Um, and what you find is that there might be um, more efficient paths to being able to get approval, et cetera. And so one of the things we considered was, you know, what was our ability to move things for given our federal um, position and you know whether or not it was going to take additional time to get through that permitting process opposed to having someone like idaho power be able to deal with it at the state level and so that was a consideration that we had as we you know kind of looked at how do we package a potential path forward here that will not only be you know effective for the region but also you know be relatively uh, quick in being able to get to some decisions, some understandings of where we're at um, in meeting all of the regulations that are out there. So I, I think there's an opportunity there um, in respect to the time it takes to go through this process and who needs to be, you know, quote unquote, the lead sled dog there. Um, but, you know, the one thing I will say is that it's been, since I've been in this role, uh, being able to watch our team come up with answers, potential answers for this. Um, has been, you know, something I think special. Uh, you look at where we had been, because this has been, you know, 10, 10 years in the making, right? Uh, so there's been a lot of advanced work. We just hadn't been able to line up things correctly. But I think being able to sit down and, and bring my own new perspective to it, as well as listen to what, you know, the other partners um, value, I, I really believe we've gotten to a point where you know, everyone can kind of feel good about the outcome because it addresses their needs. And, and so for us, uh, being able to provide firm power and transmission service um, to our customers at a low cost um, was vitally important. Uh, but there are also, you know, important things in terms of just not creating problems, not creating additional congestion problems or things of that nature through potential asset transfers, et cetera, that I think we solved. I like it. I think uh, um, uh, being public service, of course, we don't we don't bet. But um, just curious if you'd be willing to make a prediction, shall we, shall we say, as to uh, uh, when we'll see energized? When will the the line itself be be done in the ground and, and energized and ready to roll? Well, you know, I, I'm not probably willing to go out. And, and, <laughs> oh, and, Matt right. tried. Matt but, tried. But I will say this. I am I am really optimistic about where we're at, and you know I'm just really looking forward to taking this next step um, and getting something nailed down contractually so we understand what's in front of us, and then we can kind of then lay out you know what is the path forward for you know internet and getting it energized. But um, you know one step at a time for me right now. I'm really you know like I said proud of our team as well as the teams at Pacific Core in Idaho and being able to work. Um, out something to get us to this point, and I look forward to the next steps. Yeah, yeah I will. I, I think I think we do as well. And I will uh, put a promo in links in the show notes to both the term sheet and uh, News Data has got an article about this. I've told this is Thursday. The News Data story, clearing up story will come out on Friday. I'm told that uh, there'll be a story in there and link will be in the show notes. So we got all the context you need. Workshops coming up, right, John? That we can put public comments in. Love it. Now, now, John, we got to we got to take a break for capitalism here. Um, Wanted to ask if you're willing to chat a little bit more with us about uh, Bonneville's workforce, hydro operations, uh, maybe some public power adjacent stuff when we get back. Um, 
certainly am willing to do that. Um, the one question I did have is that, you know, can you can be still considered as the underground if you're now part of the corporate machine? Well, news data is owned by Rural I, another public power organization, you know, so, uh, but um, I, yes, I'm just going to say yes, because I can. So yeah, I'm still yeah. underground, still underground. So far as yeah, I can tell, it's, it's, it's totally up to Paul anyway, so. Yeah, I just I'd call whatever <laughs> I want. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Uh, we'll be back here in a second. Yeah. Okay, we're taking a short uh, intermission uh, before I hand it back for a fun game. Uh, first, we're going to get a tag in for our, another one of our sponsors, Northwest Public Power Association Believes in Public Power. That is Believes. Bam! In public power. For 82 years, NWPPA has supported public power utilities and other associates in the greater Pacific Northwest by offering education, training, communications, government relations, and services like RFP and job postings. In addition to public power, what else is important to NWPPA? Local control, member needs, integrity, and quality products and services. Today, NWPPA proudly serves 155 member utilities and more than 325 utility industry associate members. Learn more or register for a class at nwppa.org. That's nwppa.org. Tell them Paul sent you. Public power, NWPPA, they believe in public power. Now back to John and Matt for more, including a fun little game during the intermission. Don't skip past it. Okay, John, during the intermission, I wanted to play a little game, okay? I'm, a, I'm calling the game Seen, Heard, or Nothing. I'm going to give you a list of pop culture television shows, maybe a movie, and I want you to tell me if you've seen it, you've heard of it, or if you got nothing, you don't know anything about it, okay? All right. Seen, Heard, Nothing. Ted Lasso, seen, heard, or nothing? Seen. Yes. Okay. The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Heard. Okay. Glow. Nothing. Nothing. Glamorous Ladies of Wrestling. It's a Netflix show. Highly recommend. It's like vintage 80s. <laughs> it, is, it is funny. It is great. Love the show. Okay. Emily in Paris. Thing on that. What was that? The Emily, Emily in Paris, or as Matt likes to pronounce it, Emily and Patty. It's, it's true, I do. Nothing? Yeah, okay. nothing on that one. Okay, ask your daughters about it. Okay, The Expanse. Nothing. The dogs get nothing. Okay, uh, it's sci fi. I highly recommend. The, the book series is great. Wheel of Time. Bird. Okay, good. Okay. Game of Thrones. See that. <laughs> okay, good. Major League. Oh, seen that. Of course. Uh, ties. Ted Lasso, Major League. It's great, great crossover. <laughs> Succession. Oh, seen that. Yes. Oh man, I, you and I are gonna be friends. This is great. Okay. The good place. Nothing. Nothing. The Good Place is a great Nothing. comedy. It's like ethics and comedy. The, did you know Matt and I are both philosophy majors? I didn't know better. both of you were, but yeah. just having worked with Matt, I, I know he's pretty <laughs> philosophical. So, you know. Okay. Well, The Good Place is great crossover. There's a doctor of philosophy in there that is uh, one of my inspirations. Okay, I'm Dexter. Gonna, I'm going to choose to take that as a compliment, John. <laughs> Well, I will say this, you know, so I don't know if you know, when Matt worked at Bonneville, he worked in the organization I was running, our compliance organization. So, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, gosh, we hired Matt in there and, and really thought very highly of Matt, hated to see him go. But I will oh. say at times he could get pretty philosophical with assignments. So, you know, not surprising he's a philosophy major. Yeah, it's a process. It's a process. <laughs> okay, I only got a couple more, okay? Dexter? Seen that. Okay. Schitt's Creek. Heard. Okay, it's great. New Girl. Heard of that. Okay. The Umbrella Academy. Nothing. Okay, it didn't get renewed for a third season. The first two seasons were great. Okay. And The Witcher, last one, The Witcher. Nothing on that one. 
Okay. I feel like you probably aren't really in the sci-fi fantasy realm like I am, but Game of Thrones, you at least you got in there with something. Yeah. Yeah. Game of Thrones is probably as far as I go in that, in that genre. Okay. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I feel like the succession really made us bond. I just feel so much closer. Yeah. I still mind. haven't gotten into it. I need to. You haven't gotten into it yet, Matt? I know. I know. Huh. I'm sorry. That's great stuff. Isn't oh. it, John? I keep it reading great things awesome. about it. It's on the list. Yeah. Okay. I'm, that's, that's the end of the game. Congratulations. You've won the game. Ding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no, we, we don't have a, you don't got a soundboard today, Paul. I didn't get the soundboard. It'll be in in post. Sarah, put a ding in in post, please. Perfect. Okay. All right. We're back. Um, uh, Paul, please take it away from here. Okay. Um, you know, I like to frame these as the friendliest interviews in public power, John. But as you noted, we're part of a real news organization now. So I got to do a little bit more hard hitting stuff. Are you ready for a little bit more hard hitting stuff about hydro operations? I suppose I am. Okay. So I had Crystal Ball on. Thank you for letting Crystal Ball come on, you and your comms team. She was a great interview. She, and she, she helped me think through like fish risk in a different way. Really helpful as all things Crystal does is really insightful. And she emphasized that like the, the real um, in pr- big ticket cost pressure risks in post 2028 related to fish aren't so much program costs because those are all inflationary risks. And she uh, nominated Karen Connolly to come on and talk about what she thinks is the bigger risk, which is operations. Like what fish uh, mitigation impacts on hydro operations is a bigger risk post 2028. So the hard hitting question is, are you willing to let Kieran or his uh, replacement come on and talk about fish hydro operations risk? Oh yeah. So, so to that question, absolutely. You know, we'd love to have, um, you know, our folks come on and talk about that. And, you know, let me just say, uh, losing Kieran is, is pretty big for us. Um, yeah. Kieran Connolly is, is, you know, kind of a, a hydro original um, around here. You know, he knows the business, he knows operations. And, um, you know, I, I honor the fact that he's looking to do other things, but I just wanted to really speak to my personal um, kind of, you know, loss with, with Kieran leaving. Um, you know, he's, he's been a really great partner, so we hate to see him go. Yeah. But, you know, the person who is acting for him, Bill Leedy, uh, we, we can certainly make him available to come talk about hydro operations. But, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Crystal was pretty on point when she talked about operational cost being um, the greatest risk in terms of cost pressures related to fish and wildlife. Um, there's, you know, certainly there's, you know, a ton of uncertainty um, that goes along with uh, you know, the litigation and how we operate the system for fish and wildlife. Uh, you know, the recent agreement that we uh, were able to nail down with uh, plaintiffs, um, you know, with this recent litigation, I think is a prime example of the necessity to, to get some certainty around operations. Um, that agreement, you know, and it really looked at carving out some space for us um, to have long-term Um, discussions regarding the litigation to see if we can find some long-term solutions. But, you know, it was important for us to nail down something for 22 operations. Um, You know, we were looking at what could we achieve um, that would allow that space, but also allow us to be able to operate the system um, to meet not only hydropower production needs, but transportation and the other benefits that the system provides. So uh, we'll continue to work on that. But if you talk about actual value, um, you know, it goes without saying, you know, water down that system is basically fuel for it. And if we are not able to maximize the use of that fuel, then there are costs associated with it. We're not able to generate the revenues, and that has a material impact on our ability to then be able to budget for a lot of the things we would like to uh, from a fish and wildlife perspective. So, um, you know, it is one of those things that, you know, has very far-reaching impact on the organization in the region, how we do business, and what revenues we see on an annual basis. So trying to stabilize that is really a fundamental, I think, you know, kind of step in making sure that we are able to look at you know, what we can provide post-2028. All of that said, you know, I've been in this job for a year and a half, and, and it really has given me some exposure to kind of the dynamics of, you know, the fish and wildlife um, challenges. 
And, you know, I just, you know, probably every administrator before me just, you know, probably got into this chair and said, look, you know, we have to get to a point where folks are able to lay down their arms and have constructive conversations about the future. And I, and I really think this is an important juncture for us to have that conversation because not only are we dealing with the things that, you know, we traditionally all agree about in terms of getting more fish in the river, uh, we may disagree on kind of the approach to take, but we do want to see more, um, you know, fish in the river and to be able to mitigate, you know, the impacts to both fish and wildlife. But the other thing that we really have to deal with as front and center is climate change. And, and you know, they are not mutually exclusive. You know, we have to work with them in the same, you know, in kind of the same conversation. So I, you know, I am certainly... Uh, putting a lot of energy and trying to create some space for that broader conversation so we can look at things and have honest conversations about how we need to address uh, climate change as well as the challenges we see around fish and, you know, and can we do it in a way that leverages, you know, the existing system because there's so much value the existing hydro system can bring to, you know, the, the climate change fight. Have you and the people you're working with, have you has that message started to resonate on the value of hydro and accomplishing the integration of the types of resources we need to fight climate change? Are you finding an audience that's open to that conversation? You know, um, I would say behind closed doors, uh, we've had some really frank and honest conversations that I, I feel have made progress. Um, but, you know, once I think those issues get out in public, it's really tough, um, you know, to, to really express some of the things that, you know, we're able to express in private uh, regarding where we would go and how we can, you know, maybe carve out a path forward. So, you know, not publicly, but I think there's some ground being made privately. And, and, and I say that because I think that's where it needs to start. You know, yeah. you need to build that trust and, and be able to honor perspectives. And then as you move forward, um, you can maybe make some progress more publicly and sharing, you know, kind of where we've begin to merge on some thinking. And, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. There's some really great partners out there. And, and that's the way I look at it. I, you know, I think a lot of folks like to throw us in the bin of being uh, adversarial. And, and I don't think we should be adversarial. I, I, I think we're partners. I think we should be able to collaborate on our future. Uh, you know, we've talked about kids. You know, my, my kids are a little older. Um, you know, I know you have some younger children, uh, but you know, it's all about the future. It's all about what they're going to inherit in terms of an environment and what they can count on in terms of uh, reliable, safe power. Um, and, and so, you know, we need to work hard at trying to solve these problems and being able to hand over something to our, our children that is going to not only support them, but benefit society and, and, you know, and really the environment. So, um, you know, I, I feel good about, you know, the interactions I've had, but there's just so much more work to be done. And we have to get to a point where we can maybe, like I say, lay down the arms and, and, and not, you know, go after each other, um, but just really focus on, you know, what can we do in terms of benefits uh, for salmon and steelhead as we move forward. Yeah. I think you nailed it. I think the, it, these are big, complicated issues, and there is no one clear answer. Um, and, you know, the, the, the biggest hurdle that we have is education, and uh, you can't really educate people or help lead them to that information if you don't have the trust um, to do so, which was, which was the point that you made. I think that's a uh, I think I think that's what well that's what we're we're trying to focus on in our in our communication and it's it's uh it's good to hear that Bonneville's uh, taking that same tact. So yeah, well you know and, and the only the thing I'd add is is that you know when we talk about fish and wildlife and in the programmatic cost, I, I think there's also kind of a narrative that you know we're not getting what we need out of the investments we're making and and I want to tell you. Um, you know, I think we're doing a tremendous job in getting value in the investments programmatically. Uh, the partnerships that we have with our with the tribes, uh, with the states, um, are really, I think, producing tremendous value. Now, the question is, is as we make additional investments, as you know, are those the right investments? Are we going to see, um, you know, those um, investments, those projects yield the results that we need to have as we move forward? 
Um, and so, you know, we're going to continue to look at how do we fund these programs um, that are producing um, great results. And, and, you know, as we move forward, uh, you know, there's always a debate. You know, I always hear, well, Bonneville, you guys are doing so great financially. Why is it you can't increase budgets? Well, just the fat, mere fact that there may be, you know, um, available funds doesn't mean that you necessarily have to utilize those funds. Uh, you know, for those purposes, we're still going to require uh, transparency and we're still going to require, you know, our folks to go through and make sure we're assessing the effectiveness, the efficacy of these approaches that we're taking. Um, so that way, when we do make investments, we know that there's going to be a, a really strong connection to the return on that investment. And, and so, you know, it's, it's always a challenge when you're put in a position where you have to be that trusted steward, um, you're not always going to make someone happy, but, you know, you have to honor that, um, you know, that role and just do the best you can in making sure that you're uh, looking at things as equitably as possible. As a, as a rate payer and a member of public power, uh, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and the framing around stewardship, I think, is really appropriate, right? It's a stewardship yes. of the natural resource, and it's a stewardship of public goods and public funds. So, uh and I really, just to tie it back, the culture and the openness and the communicating with people in the region, I think is a really healthy framework for these types of discussions. So it uh, comes back to culture, mm -hmm. doesn't it, Matt? Well, and also, you know, uh, to tie it back once again is, uh, sounds like we've got free reign to go after both Bill and Kieran. So, uh, yeah, you know, maybe you can put in that. a good word with Kieran even after he <laughs> exits. Like, this is fun, right? Right, John, you're having fun. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. I, you know, I, I will definitely, you know, pass it on. But, you know, hey, we still have a little bit left. So let's see how it goes. And, and oh, fair enough. Yeah, it's early yet, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the transition, John. Um, I, I was open to, uh, to pivot to people if I could, uh, which is a, a favorite topic for both Paul and myself. Um, one of the changes that you've made um, over this past year uh, was uh, organizational restructuring, particularly at the executive level. Um, so you had a press release that announced two new organizations, both of which are being led by Dan James um, as the uh, chief workforce and strategy officer. Um, and so aside from giving Dan uh, a pretty awesome title, if I'm being completely honest, um, how are you and Dan positioning uh, Bonneville to attract and retain high skilled, qualified and diverse candidates? Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and that's a challenge for, you know, quite honestly, almost every utility in, in the region. Agreed. Um, you know, I'll, I'll step back and just say that the, the primary focus of our new workforce and strategy office is really the, enrich, the enrichment and strengthening of our organization's commitment and executive focus on our people, culture, and work environment. Um, you know, that's critically important. When I got into this role, and going through, you know, kind of midstream into this pandemic, I, I just thought it was just critically important that we pay particular attention to our people. Uh, you know, all of the stressors that we're encountering, um, the change in work environment, uh, I didn't want that, you know, to go unnoticed. And I wanted to make sure that we were focusing in on that. So that became a big part of what we do as an organization. And, and while we've made, I think, tremendous progress in recent years, um, you know, it's been really an important piece to, to look at our culture, and that's something, Paul, that you've been talking about, um, and making sure that that culture brings positive results to our organization by boosting pride, um, employee job satisfaction, and, as you're mentioning, recruitment and retention. Um, you know, all of these things enhance our work environment. Uh, and the important thing is that if you have a strong culture, then you're able to execute on your strategy. Uh, you know, we've talked about it that, you know, unless you have a real co strong corporate culture, uh, you know, your strategy is toast. You're just not going to be able to execute on it. So, you know, all of that is really aligned with that focus on our people and making sure not only are, you know, we're paying attention to their well-being, but also making sure that we're able to execute on the things that we think are important. The other thing I added to that was, um, you know, during, you know, maybe the prior, I would say, six or seven years, our strategy function had, had been essentially dismantled, uh, you know, after, and, and so I thought it was important to revive the strategy function, 
and have it focus on providing research, analysis, um, advice to our agency leaders so that we could make the, the best informed decisions uh, we could, you know, with real-time information. And so, you know, I've really pushed to get that reestablished. So that's, you know, the second piece to Dan's uh, kind of portfolio is that strategy piece. And it's going to be even more important as we go through and, and, and you know, kind of refresh our current corporate strategy. Uh, in terms of, you know, just kind of how are we recruiting folks? Uh, well, you know, I think that the main focus for us right now will be um, how do we uh, streamline the hiring process, the federal hiring process? Uh, I think that's going to be important. Um, and also, how do we attract employees to, you know, work for the federal government, work for a utility? Uh, I think making the connection to some of the things we talked about, uh, the fight against culture or climate change is going to be, you know, important in getting the attention of potential candidates. Um, streamlining that process will be critical because, you know, I can tell you in my 30 year career at Bonneville, I've gone out on recruiting trips and it's tough. You know, you're sitting there talking about all the great things you do. And when, um, you know, say a candidate at a college job fair says, well, great, you know, I'm interested. How, you know, how do you sign me up? And I have to tell them, well, you know, here's the process. You're going to have to go. It may be six months before you hear back, but at the end of it, you're going to be really, uh, you know, happy about the job you get. That doesn't always resonate when next door is Procter and Gamble and they can hire them on the spot. So, you know, we've got to figure out how to, um, you know, deal with that disadvantage that we have. And so we're going to work hard. I've asked Dan to explore all avenues, and and we're going to see if we can't come up with something that's going to allow us to to really address that concern. Um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, through this, you know, I so I don't want to be overly negative about the process because the process is important. Uh, you know, we have, I think, really strong representation, for example, from our veterans, um, and, it, and it's a, you know, byproduct of that process. So, um, you know, that's something that we honor and, and certainly, I think, has uh, helped us as an organization. But we want to also make sure that we're reaching out to other groups, other diverse groups as well. And so, you know, bolstering our recruitment efforts to better, you know, reach uh, underrepresented communities is something I've asked Dan to do, uh, setting up strategic alliances with, uh, you know, schools, uh, with trade organizations uh, will also help us in terms of getting more candidates um, in the process. And so, you know, I think all of those things are going to be something that helps us in the long run. But with this changing work environment, uh, we're also going to have to look at how does our culture change? And under Dan's umbrella, we also have our new culture office um, that's led by Elisa Yanello. And, um, you know, she's just a dynamo uh, and has been a central point of all of our culture work. And, 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 and I really feel good about us being able to not only kind of continue on the path that we have culturally, but also establish some new aspects to our culture that will reflect this new work environment. And that's going to be important in being able to retain or, or recruit and retain new employees. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about recognizing how our people, um, you know, our culture, our work environment directly connects to the strategy development and execution that we expect. And, you know, and I think um, you know, like I said before, I think all of these efforts really recognize the fact that good business strategy, uh, you know, whatever direction you want to take an organization is nothing without people uh, to make it happen. So we, we have to open those doors. We have to get people, you know, in here, and, and we also have to be able to retain them. Uh, so hopefully that gets that kind of your, your question, but, you know, let me know if there's something that you'd like me to follow up there. Uh, I, I, I think you nailed it. I think, um, you know, the, the focus on culture, I think, is, is important. And I think that is, uh, I'd agree that it's basically the apex of that pyramid, right? And I think the, um, the statement uh, or the phrase that I hear uh, seemingly with increasing frequency, but I think I first heard when I was working for you uh, in compliance at Bonneville is a uh, culture elite strategy for breakfast. Um, and so uh, focusing there first, uh, I think, is essential and absolutely the right path forward. Uh, and appreciate the response. Yeah, and I'll just yeah. I'll, I'll 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 follow up and say 
the focusing on the culture to drive the strategy to accomplish the mission, I think resonates with people, right? When you go recruit somebody and you can articulate how your culture can execute on a strategy to fulfill your mission, I think people get the vision, right? And when you're starting in a new industry, you want to get it. You want to understand how what I do today is going to help do this big thing in the future. And that's what I heard from you. I think it, I think that's the right path personally. And why it matters. Why you it know, matters. People, people want to do things that have an impact uh, and right. explaining you know, how, how that, that can happen and how that will happen, um, I think is essential to getting the right people in the roles. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and I will definitely keep this um, link to this podcast, you know, on my Rolodex. So if I get any pushback in our management committees, I will say that, you know, Paul and Matt agreed with me. So I think that's going to give me a lot of capital there. So I appreciate it. Yeah, that, I have to assume that'll be all you need. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, Matt and I focus on people and workforce because he and I think share this opinion that our industry is going to need to expand to accommodate large scale electrification. So one of the like inputs into my mental model is Saul Griffith, Griffith, who was the founder of Rewiring America and author to Electrify, which is on a bookshelf behind me next to Bond Bright's uh, rate making principles. Um, he has this hypothesis that we're gonna need in the US a million more electricians and a million more HVAC technicians above and beyond our retiring workforce. And for me, and I think I speak for Matt, because we've talked about this before, we've asked people about this before, that ties to our industry, right? As electric utility enthusiasts, this electric utility industry is also going to need to expand, and in our hypothesis, to meet the needs of this electrification. So I, I really, I'd love to get your take on our hypothesis and what that would mean for your transmission business unit specifically, because um, I think the the needs of a distribution system ultimately translate to needing more transmission and maintenance of a transmission system to fill that electrification need. What do you think of my hypothesis? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's in the right, you know, it's definitely on the right path because, you know, for us, the question isn't really about, um, you know, electrification. It's, it's more of a discussion for, you know, that's more of a discussion for the distribution utilities, as you mentioned. I think for us, it's really about how do we hire, um, you know, folks in the technical areas that will allow us to be able to support our customers, um, you know, with high voltage transmission and, and get them integrated. And so, you know, I look at it as, you know, we've got challenges in hiring uh, folks, you know, for our crews, um, our dispatchers, a lot of those technical areas that, um, as I mentioned before, you know, we've got to set up those strategic partnerships uh, with education, uh, with, uh, you know, trade organizations to make sure that we're getting folks interested and, you know, with the technical skills necessary um, to be able to, um, you know, be effective in these areas. And so, you know, we're um, working hard in setting up, um, you know, those alliances. We're also, you know, making an investment in young people. Um, you know, I think our Science Bowl is one of those examples. Uh, you know, how we invest in, in students and get them excited about what we do at BPA. So, you know, creating or generating that excitement, um, those strategic alliances are going to be critical. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, as we sit down and, and, and meet on a weekly basis to talk about our transition back to the workplace and we get, you know, information, say, uh, regarding COVID and the amount of infections that we have, you know, part of that information is, okay, well, where are we in terms of the number of folks we have, the depth chart that we have, yeah. if we begin to lose folks? And, you know, and it's concerning. It's concerning. And it's twofold. I mean, we had problems in hiring folks in these technical areas before the pandemic. Yep. Now that we're in the pandemic and we're beginning to see, you know, these challenges around vaccine mandates and whether folks want to take the vaccine and whether they're going to be able to continue to work, et cetera. As that all gets worked out, I have to be aware of the fact that we may have people leaving. And if those people leave and we see this accelerated exodus, um, you know, the things that you're talking about, our ability to be able to bring people on, to get folks interested in this line of work, 
are going to be critical because we're going to really begin to see, um, you know, diminishing numbers quickly, and we're going to have to have a path forward to be able to replenish um, the workforce. And, and I do think there is, and you spoke to it with the recruiting of young people, there is a, a, a lot of work to be done on meeting your customer needs, right? It is that, and I, I appreciated when you, when you started with this topic is we're going to have pressure to meet electrification needs, I think, as electric utilities and you as our partner on the transmission, uh, trying to make sure you have the right depth of bench to be able to support us. So I, I do think there's work on for both of us coming in this electrification effort. Yeah. Thanks to mention the science pool, John, as we were putting together um, kind of the, the, the concept for this for this interview, I'd completely forgotten about that. That was one of the, uh, volunteering at that event was one of the more fun things I did while I was working with Bonneville. Um, and Paul, you would love it. Uh, I will send you a link and I will throw it out there as something we will be including in the show notes going forward. Yes, we got to get that in the show notes. Hey, who knows? I don't know if it could work out, but maybe you can do a podcast from one of our Science Bowl events. That'd be kind of cool. That'd be super go. cool. I love this. This is dynamic. We're supporting each other and helping each other. I love this cross-promotional yeah. opportunity. How change happens. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, so, John, Paul and I uh, basically uh, selfishly teed up the conversations today um, around topics that we wanted to talk about. Um, and we sincerely appreciate your engagement and your willingness to do that, but uh, also wanted to kind of open it up. Is there anything that you're excited about that you have, haven't yet had an opportunity to address? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, the one thing I will say is, you know, I, I go back again to just all the tremendous work we've been doing. I, I think, you know, um, when I got into this role, um, there was a lot of learning to take place and it, and it continues to be, I mean, you never get to a point where you're not learning in this role. Um, you know, you you have to listen, you have to learn. Uh, but one of the, the, the important issues that came up quickly was just kind of where we were at in terms of the future of market development. And, you know, we were moving down the path of making a decision around EIM, which, you know, I really, you know, focused on and made sure that, you know, we heard what we needed to hear from our customers and we made the right decision moving forward. Uh, but it also allowed me to get a feel for kind of where things were at in a broader sense. You know, when you look at, you know, things like resource adequacy, you look at, you know, extended day ahead markets or even potentially an RTO. And so, you know, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing around future markets, um, you know, and, and, and their development and making sure that BPA plays a leadership role. Uh, I think it was important for me to get a better understanding of where things were at before, you know, I, you know, I typically say lead with our chin, but, you know, I, I really uh, believe that we need to be in a leadership role when we have those discussions around market design and, and where we had as a, as a region. And so, uh, you know, we're going to continue to play that role. We've set up a process uh, to start you know, looking at how do we evaluate potential opportunities. Um, and we're going to start with and, and make sure our focus ma is maintained on resource adequacy. Uh, you know, I think it's critical that the region gets that done right. And, you know, I'm really encouraged by the broad participation and interest um, in the Western uh, Resource Adequacy Program. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the warning signs are there. Um, you know, last summer's heat dome, the things that we've seen in terms of just the changing climate. So, you know, I'm really proud of how our people and our system um, have performed during these extreme weather events, you know, over the last couple of years. But, you know, we have to be prepared for the future. And, you know, that really um, is important. That program's important. So we're, we're all in. We want to make sure that uh, we see a really good um, development there. You know, we'll have to, uh, once we see how we get through this non-binding phase, uh, we'll sit down with our customers and we'll get input and, and we'll see where we need to go. But um, I think it's critical for the region and, and it's critical that we get it done right. And what I'm seeing in terms of governance and those types of things, I think we're on the right path. In terms of, you know, just, you know, the next step after that to me is looking at, you know, kind of market development, you know, as well as, you know, in terms of, you know, data head. Um, and, you know, we've got a couple of, Kind of uh, processes out there. You have the ISO, and you have uh, potentially um, SPP. Um, you know, 
wanting to demonstrate what they can provide in terms of potential day ahead opportunities. So, you know, we're going to be um, really, really involved in evaluating uh, those um, opportunities and, you know, engaging our customers, getting feedback and seeing where we need to land there. Um, I think, you know, that's the logical next step after we nail the uh, resource adequacy program. And all of this lends itself to kind of that incremental approach that I want to take with markets. And, and I think that's the approach that we really do need to take. You know, I've told folks that uh, the one thing about EIM, uh, you know, the governance structure isn't preferable per se around EIM, but it's sufficient. Um, and, you know, the voluntary nature of that product also lends itself to it being sufficient. But when you start talking day ahead, um, you know, that, that voluntary nature, I don't think, can be part of that conversation. And so the importance around governance, you know, is really amplified. And, and so we need to make sure that any next step, particularly around, um, you know, extended day ahead markets need to be, um, you know, centered around governance and making sure we've got a really strong governance structure um, driven by membership in place. And, and so, you know, we'll have to evaluate. We have to see where things land and, and see, um, you know, how things turn out. But I, I think, you know, that's an important next step and Bonneville needs to be, you know, kind of front and center in that. And then, you know, there's been discussions about RTO and, and whether, you know, there needs to be, um, you know, a little bit more push there. And, and so, uh, we, you know, we see ourselves, heck, you know, we're, what, 75, 80% of the high voltage transmission. We got to be there, you know, we got to be part of the table. So, um, so we will, um, you know, have a, um, you know, I think a more influential uh, posture as we move forward in those dis uh, discussions, but they all have to be done, I think, in an incremental uh, kind of phased approach. Uh, so that way we get everything right as we move forward. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm looking forward to that. I'm really proud about where we're at, um, where our team is at there. And then, you know, finally, I'll just talk about, you know, some of the things we talked about in terms of strategy and what we're doing strategically as an organization. You know, we, uh, I would say BPA is operating from a position of financial strength right now. We've had a pretty good financial year. Um, you know, the updates to our financial plan, I think, will only bolster that strength. Um, but it's important that we hear from our customers. And that's why we've got the processes in place to do that. Um, you know, we're going to look to enhance our financial plan, uh, but we're also going to turn our attention to our strategic plan. That strategic plan expires here in 2023. And, and I would like to get us in position to have a real strong um, strategic direction through uh, 2028. I think the, um, the key to this is our provider of choice uh, effort. Uh, and, you know, the goal is to fully subscribe the system's, um, you know, long-term firm power. So uh, I think there's a lot of things for us to do. Uh, we're in the process of getting those things done now. Uh, but, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited about what, you know, the future holds. And I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have with our customers, our constituents in the region about what the future of the Bonneville Power Administration uh, needs to be the role we need to play in climate change, and the value that we're going to bring as a low-carbon, low-cost, um, you know, uh, power provider. I, I think that's going to be important. And then on the transmission side, uh, we're going to be making investments. Uh, you know, I think B2H uh, is a really good example of how we're trying to think strategically. Um, and we're going to continue to work with customers in the region to make sure um, that, you know, we're evaluating all the opportunities that are out there uh, to make strategic investments and increase capacity and, and flow for the um, for the region. So, um, you know, I'm I'm really proud of those processes, and I'm I'm just really proud of the people who work for Bonneville Power and being able to to lead this organization. I can't say enough about you know the things that they've been able to do. And, and like I said at the beginning, um, you know, the only thing I could do after day one by myself is fail. Um, you know, they have really. Um, been so instrumental in carrying forward, um, you know, all of the successes that we have. And, and so, you know, when we talk about success at Bonneville, um, I appreciate, you know, the recognition, but it really goes to our people.
Yeah, I'm really heartened by your focus on leadership and market evolution, strategy that incorporates post 2028, and fully subscribing the federal system with public power. And those are incredibly heartening. What about for you, Matt? Was that fun? Was that great? It was great. I think uh, uh, I think you pretty much nailed it all there, John. Uh, I don't know if there's anything left out there in the executive summary, we'll call it. Uh. <laughs> so usually we end these with like, like something lighthearted and uplifting, like some Ted Lasso conversation or our mutual dislike of seasonal time change and pivot tables. Um, but as Matt and I were prepping, you know, we both hear stories of your children and we think that y'all you've figured out parenting something we are still trying to grow in. So last thing, do you have any parenting gems for those of us in the region that are still trying to be better people and better parents? How do you make good humans, John? <laughs> well, you, you have to have a, a really great partner. <laughs> And, and I've been uh, the beneficiary of that. My wife Paige has done a tremendous job, um, and and you know really helping raise our our children. Um, you know she sacrificed a lot of things to to be at home and and spend the time with them, and and so you know the results are have been really good so far. But the one thing I will say is that you're always a parent, right? <laughs> and so even as they get out of the house, you still worry about them and. And you still, you know, try to help them in making decisions. You can't always say the right decision because, you know, once they do grow up, they make those decisions. But, you know, you just help them make the best informed decision they can make. Uh, but, yeah, I know I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, the one thing I would say is time and then, you know, just a, a really great partner in helping you uh, with that. Like it goes back to the uh, there's a Mark Twain quote, you know, that the, the true secret to happiness is to choose your parents wisely. Um, so it's the other side of that coin, right? Uh, make sure you've got a good yeah. partner um, and do the best you can. Yeah. Right. I got one of those things right so far. We'll see yep. what happens with the rest of it. Yep. Um, so, John, thank you very much for the conversation. Um, sincerely hope that you're going to be willing to come back for your second anniversary, if not before. Um, and at that point, um, I think the traditional gift for year two is cotton. Uh, so if nothing else, we'll have a great excuse to get some T-shirts made. Um, Got to get some and, merch. Uh, Got to get know. some merch. Are you going to buy some merch if we get merch, John? Public Power Underground merch? <laughs> as long as it's not worth more than 20 bucks, I think we're okay, right? Well, I'm not going to give it to you. You're going to have to buy it, John. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll buy it then. Hey. Uh, we I love it. Enthusiast. And hopefully by then I'll, we can actually I'll, get I'll together warn, and get a nice group photo. Yeah, I'll, I'll warn um, Bill Leedy as he, what he's coming into here. But, um, yeah, no, I really appreciate the opportunity. The only, thing, the only thing I would ask is, you know, maybe now that we've got this down, we treat it like, you know, hosting – Saturday Night Live, where there's a competition as to how many times you host. So, you know, I, as long as I can stay above the curve, you know, maybe host more than anybody else, I'm good. So, yep. yeah. Hey, used right, to be, used to be, that's how you earned the, the big belt as opposed to the little one you got there, right? Um, Paul, what's yeah. next, right? You, you got rid of the, the big anadromous belt. Uh, so, well, it's so that Kurt next? Miller won't give it up, right? Oh, Kurt okay. Miller covets the big belt so much. Somebody's actually going to have to physically take it from him. <laughs> Uh, but I love the <laughs> SNL style hosting. That's I, I love it. We're vibing here, John. This is great absolutely stuff. great content. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, Kurt, Kurt's a well-deserving guy. He he uh, he deserves the big belt. I have a lot of uh, a, a lot of respect for Kurt and what he does. He's doing good work. Agreed. Yep. Well, thanks you. Thank you for joining. We will close it out and uh, and uh, go back to the underground for more news. This is a bonus episode. So subscribe. John, you're going to give us a five-star review, right? Five stars on your Apple podcast device. Five star. That's right. Okay. <laughs> there you, take it from Thank John. You. Five stars on that app and we'll let you go. Thank you for taking the time, John. We very much appreciate it. Great to see you again. All right. Thank you. Started Thanks to John and Matt for the informative conversation. In. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and leave a nice note, just like John did, to help others find our fun industry content. To make sure you don't miss the next episode or other great bonus content, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. 
You don't have to be subscribed to News Data to get this podcast, but it sure makes our podcast make a lot more sense. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. With knowledge to trust, we know we aren't perfect. Sometimes it's a bust, but we'll roll on, enthusiasts roll on. Public Power Underground is a production of Clots Connect Beauty and News Data. The views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Clots Connect Beauty and News Data or the organizations of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. It's written and directed by Clots Connect Beauty's power department, led by me, Paul Dockery, and it's edited and published by the stellar team at Pioneer Utility Resources, led by associate producer Sarah Wooden. Our theme song, Roll on Enthusiast, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Gillerini and Bledsoe. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. Roll on Columbia, roll on.